Praise God. So let's go to God in prayer uh, as we look at the third of the end time uh, prophecy series on, that we're teaching on. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that your word gives wisdom and your word teaches us all things. We recognize, Father, that we do not know all things. We do not always understand all things. And we thank you, Lord, that you have given your word to enable us, to guard us, to keep us to edify us so that we would be aware of all that is happening, especially in the times that we live in. We ask, so God, that we may be among the wise. For your word says those who are wise will understand the things of the end times. So we ask for a fresh measure of the spirit of wisdom and understanding and revelation that we would know the times that we live in that we will understand the era by which we are called to in this generation. We ask, O oh God, that you cause our eyes to understand, our mind to receive comprehension. It will cause the spirit of wisdom and revelation to come upon our hearts and our minds, that we may know, understand all that your word says of these days of the end time. And give us clarity, give us understanding, and cause us to know what to do in these times that we live in. For all that you do, Father, we will give you the glory, honour and worship. We thank you, Father, that you hide me behind your cross and cause all to see Jesus and Jesus alone. We worship you and love you. Always, Father, with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, and everyone say, Amen. Praise God, we are on the third in a series of the end times and um, there's been much teaching and many books written and especially uh, as we come closer and closer to the end times, you'll find more and more books coming out and sometimes the books contradict one another which is a reason for this series so that we know what the Bible actually says. Uh, let's look at the book of Daniel and uh, pick up from where we left off the last week where we talk about the ten toes or the ten horns. In the book of Daniel, in the book of Daniel, we see the progress in uh, Daniel's visions. The book of Daniel has 12 chapters divided into two halves. Chapter 1 to chapter 6 is all historical records and, uh, about the events that took place. From chapter 7 to chapter 12 are all prophetic records in which is record a lot of Daniel's dreams and, uh, and all that Daniel uh, was given to understand uh, of the end times. Let's begin in Daniel chapter 7. Uh, Daniel had a vision of four great beasts in verse 3. The book of Daniel chapter 7 verse 3. Four great beasts came out from the sea, each different from the other. First was like a lion, had eagle's wings. I watched till his wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise and devour much flesh. Verse, verse 6. After this I looked and there was another like a leopard which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. And verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, a huge iron teeth, it was devouring, breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the bees that was before it and it had ten horns. This was a fourth beast. I was considering the horns and there was another horn, a little horn, a little one coming up among them before whom three of the first horns were plucked out of the roots and there... In this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. What a vision 
What a what a, a vision of the night, which he could have had it in a dream or the dream, which in those days were called a vision of the night. In fact, it looks like a nightmare. Imagine seeing these four creatures, you know, uh, surprised that Daniel didn't wake up screaming. You know, maybe some of you ladies, you receive the gift of prophecy. You might see, you know, 10 bees coming up, you know, and you say, get it behind me, devil. You thought it's the devil. And uh, God can reveal some of these things. And uh, you some, we sometimes know not what we ask. Say, God, I want to be a prophet. Ah, yeah. Wait till the prophetic anointing comes on you. And uh, God can reveal various things unto us. So here, uh, Daniel did not understand those things. And this is where sometimes the Bible gives us the interpretation. And so we don't have far to run. In fact, Daniel didn't understand it. And uh, in verse uh, 10, uh, verse 16, same chapter 7, verse 16, I came near to one of those who stood by me in a vision and asked him the truth of this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation. So he was given the interpretation. See, sometimes Daniel, who was a great prophet himself, didn't understand and uh, receiving a prophecy and interpreting a prophecy are two different things. Receiving a dream and interpreting a dream are two different things. Sometimes we have one but not the other, and we should not move unless the Spirit tells us so. So even Daniel had to ask for the interpretation, and the interpretation was given to him. In uh, verse 17, those great beasts, which are four, are four kings, actually four empires, which will rise out of the earth. The saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. And uh, so as uh, he was uh, being told uh, about all these four beasts, he says in verse 19, I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast uh, which was there. And uh, because the fourth beast was the most terrible and had ten horns. To summarize this thing, the four beasts represent the four major world empires that had ruled the Middle Eastern area. We know from secular history that there are a lot of empires too uh, in those days. Uh, there's empires in China, there's empires in India, and the Mayan Empire over in South America. All those could exist. But the Bible is recorded from the point of the Israelite nation. So only the empires that affected the Middle East and Israel were counted in this prophecy that Daniel received. And Daniel lived in the time of the Babylonian Empire, which is the first empire, uh, the head of gold. Uh, the Babylonian Empire was replaced later on by the Medio Persian Empire. And Daniel lived long enough to see both. He lived and he was taken as a young man captive under Nebuchadnezzar and he lived right through the Babylonian Empire until the second great empire which was the Medio Persian Empire and under Darius and Cyrus. Uh, so Daniel saw two empires. After the Medio Persian Empire was the third empire which was the Greek Empire and uh, under uh, Philip and Alexander the Great. And then the fourth empire is the Roman Empire, which uh, was large and which was the fourth beast, out of which arise the little horn. The little horn and the ten horns are representative of the Antichrist, which nowadays is uh, even the secular world talks about the Antichrist and Armageddon, Armageddon and all those things. We need to look at it from the Bible perspective. So that was what Daniel received. Now remember last week we mentioned that uh, there will be the ten horns that arise after the Roman Empire in uh, verse 23. Let's look at verse 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. Now all this is his easy for us to interpret because it's history. And you can uh, check recorded history. The fourth kingdom on earth we shall be different from all other kingdoms, shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. So the fourth beast is the Roman Empire. 
Then it says in verse 24, the ten horns are ten kings which shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and he shall subdue three kings. And then it talks about some of the things that the Antichrist will do. And so what we saw last week uh, was that uh, there's a Roman Empire, which is to us in our modern, modern day in this year 2009, it's way past, it's our history, way back, the Roman Empire. is way long gone, behind us in history. However, the ten horns, verse 23 could be history for us. Verse 24 is still in our future. The ten kings or ten toes uh, of Nebuchadnezzar's dream are still in our future. It hasn't occurred yet. There is no such conglomerate empire that is consisting of ten sections joined together. Now, these ten toes will cover the whole area of the old Roman Empire. And we know that's more than the European Union. So some people thought European Union, that's the revise. It will be part of it, but not all of it. Remember, as long as it doesn't affect Israel yet, it's not counted. These are all empires that affect and contact Israel. And so we're unique here in history. Roman Empire behind us, the fourth empire, and the ten horns in front of us in our future, which has not happened. And last week I mentioned that the ten horns will rise first. After that, the Antichrist will rise out from the ten horns. And uh, based on verse 24, the ten horns are ten kings which shall arise from this kingdom, referring to the fourth empire, from this whole section of the Roman Empire, and another shall rise after them. After them. That means the ten horns exist for some time before the Antichrist comes forth. We will most likely see some semblance of what the ten horns represent. And in my book, uh, Foundation Series uh, 14, I give some possible examples of what the ten sections of the Old Roman Empire could be. And... Uh, we know it's, in our time, still formative. Still formative. It is not completed yet. Definitely, the European Union will be a part of that. But it's still not finished yet. Still in our future. Which is why, as we teach the end times, what we want to cover section by section today is what we call the three end time assumptions. Three end time assumptions. There are a lot of predictions of the end time, but there's something that is assumed and it's the assumption that we will see. For example, look at what it says the Antichrist will do. It says here that uh, in verse 25 and 26, the Antichrist, let's look at what he will do. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, shall intend to change times and law, then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. Then expression time, times, and half a time is confusing for many people. What kind of language is this? A time, times, and half a time. The Bible interprets itself. When you look at what time, times, and half a time mean, in the book of Revelation chapter 12, turn with me to Revelation chapter 12. This is where we get its own interpretation. Because in Revelation 12, it talks about one event, and it describes it in two ways. In Revelation chapter 12, it talks about the woman and the male child in verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God 
that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Now, 1,260 days is 360 plus 360 plus 360 plus half of 360. It is three and a half prophetic year. A prophetic year is not 365 and a quarter days like a secular year. A prophetic year is 360 days exactly. And so it is, remember that the last section of uh, the last time of the Antichrist is seven years, called the last week, which represents seven years. So half of those seven years, which is three and a half prophetic years, makes 1,260 days. This woman here represents Israel. It represents Israel who will run from, flee from the Antichrist in the second half of the tribulation week. Now, all scholars agree on this point, that the last seven years are significant of the time of the Antichrist. From the moment the Antichrist rises till the Antichrist finish, the Bible is quite precise. It's called the last week of Daniel. There are 70 weeks, 69 weeks have finished, one week left. It's the one week represents seven years. So of the seven years of the Antichrist, it's divided exactly into three and a half, three and a half. That's the last week of the Antichrist. So the Antichrist reign is actually already predicted in the Bible to last no longer than seven years. Three and a half plus three and a half. And uh, in Revelation chapter 12, in the second half of the seven years, when the Antichrist has what we call the abomination of desolation. Even Jesus mentioned about it. So Jesus believed in Daniel's prophecy. So Jesus, the seven years are marked right in the middle by what we call the abomination. Oops, this thing's coming up. The abomination of desolation, right in the middle, dividing it nicely. Uh, the abomination of desolation, that's it, right, dividing in the middle of the, the seven years, cutting out into half. So why the middle is so important? Because in the first part of the seven years, the Antichrist will come as Christ. He's not going to come and say, I am the Antichrist, believe in me. No, he's not going to come that way. Nobody will believe in him. He won't come as, I'm the devil, believe in me. No, no, he'll come as, I am God, believe in me. So he's going to come as the Christ. And for three and a half years, he will deceive the nation of Israel. And then in the middle of it, he will do what Jesus says, the abomination of desolation. Jesus said, when you see it happen, run. Jesus himself said, the abomination of desolation. And uh, uh, then the three and a half years when he does the abomination of desolation, true Israel will run into the wilderness for the three and a half years, which is why you have the woman running in Revelation 12 for 1,260 days from three and a half years. Now, let's finish the point that we're making in chapter 12, verse 6. It describes the woman running. Now, this woman is described again in verse 14 of Revelation 12. And this time, the timing is mentioned. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for, and here is it, a time, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the Bible interprets itself. The same incident described twice. One using chronological mathematics saying it's 1,260 days. The other using the prophetic phrase, a time, times, and half a time. They both mean the same thing. Having taken that vocabulary from the Bible, time, times, and half a time in Hebrew actually means year, years, and half a year. 
So that's their prophetic language. And uh, so understanding that they are synonymous with 1,260 days, then we realize that in Daniel chapter 7, going back to Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, when he, when he persecuted the saints, and saints are given under, under his hands, was time, times, and half a time referred to the same period of the three and a half years. Three and a half years. So that's why we allow the Bible to interpret itself without adding anything. The Bible equates time, times, and half a time as 1,260 days. Now, having established that, let's uh, look at some uh, things here that describe uh, about the Antichrist in chapter, Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 onwards. That is where the abomination of desolation is mentioned. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. See that one week. But in the middle of the week, represent the last seven years, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even unto the consummation which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. It's talking about something happening in the Jewish temple, which actually happened under, under a person uh, named Antiochus uh, Epiphanes IV. He actually sacrificed a pig in the Jewish uh, temple. Uh, he was a type of the Antichrist. But it points to some abomination that will happen in the last days done by the Antichrist. Then let's look at Matthew 24 where Jesus mentioned the same thing. See, Jesus believed in the prophecy of Daniel. Verse 15. Verse 15. So Jesus was familiar with the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 24, verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel, the prophet standing in the holy place, Whoever reads, let him understand. Let those who are in Judea flee into the wilderness. Same as in Revelation 12, the woman fleeing in the wilderness. So Jesus himself says, there's a time coming when the abomination of desolation will take place at the end of time. Now to us, that is still in the future. It hasn't occurred yet. The Antichrist hasn't risen yet. All these are still in our present future. The Bible is predictive of many things in this future. And so if the Antichrist is going to do all those things in the temple and, and at first, you no, know, he will come like a, a, a good person and deceive the Jews, restore back all the Jewish things until he changed in the middle of the week. There is assumption number one that there will be a temple. I mean, all these things cannot happen without a temple. See, we are, we are looking in between the lines because what we're interested in is not all these things. And all this could be some, too complicated for some of us. But what we are all interested in is how near we are to the end of time. Uh, I don't think 2012 will be the end of the world, by the way. <laughs> In case some of you are thinking, you know, oh, two, you know, 2011, December, you know, you sell all you have or you take a huge loan and then thinking 2012, the world's going to end and do whatever you want. 2013, declared bankrupt. <laughs> no money to pay back. So, no. Uh, I, I realized uh, that 2012 is based on a Mayan calendar calculation. And all the, if you read carefully the Mayan calendar, which has its different culture and different things, all they talk about was a change. Some change. And it is the third change in the world for them because their calendar is measured differently. It's the third major shift in the world. And it's all these Hollywood movies who, who actually like to imagine 
and uh, uh, things, m- of course, m- more dramatic. And then, of course, you know, it's a reasonably good movie, you know. And uh, so, uh, and, and just to f- make it more exciting. You know, you remember how, how they make the story of Moses? Have you ever seen? There are three or four stories of Moses. They have to add funny things into the story of Moses. They have to add love story inside. In the story of Moses, when I was uh, watching it long, long ago, you know, uh, the, the princess of Egypt was in love with Moses. And uh, then Moses was in love with the Ethiopian in the wilderness. And I remember this scene so clearly in the unbiblical story of Moses. As Moses went out to seek God, the two women were talking to one another. So, so the, uh, uh, the, the Ethiopian wife that Moses had was telling the princess of Egypt, who was also in love with Moses. They had to make these stories exciting. At least no one will watch a movie. And uh, so uh, 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 she was saying to, to the princess, she says, you know, you lost him when he went to seek God. I lost him when he found God. <laughs> it's, it's not in your Bible. <laughs> okay, not in your Bible. And uh, so they had to make all these things say, yeah. No doubt, I believe that we are going to see, I definitely sense that we will see some sort of major changes around the year 2012, 2011. Uh, major changes. Because as I mentioned in teaching the end times, and in studying the end times, that uh, the, the 19th century is a time of the pound, when the pound rules the world. 20th century is of the US dollar. 21st century is the euro. Unfortunately, it's not going to the yuan, it's going to the euro. It's, it's like we are moving in that direction because of the Bible prophecy. There's, there has to be in place. So assumption one is that the Antichrist to do all that he needs to do, the temple has to be built. And so far, three, two major temples have been built. Solomon's temple, Herod's temple, in which Jesus was. The third temple has yet to be built. They couldn't build it today because on the very place where they're supposed to build the temple, a mosque sits. And there are a lot of reasons and political reasons and religious reasons why they cannot just remove it. It looks like God used events to prevent prophecy from taking place under its time. Now, how would that happen? I do not know. But one thing we know, the third temple must be built first before the Antichrist could even arise and come. Which means assumption one is important. As long as the third temple is not built, we're not really near the end yet. How long will it take to build a temple? If it's going to be as exquisite as the Herod's temple and Solomon's temple, you all remember Solomon's temple took seven years to build. And they had thousands upon thousands of workmen. Today we might not need that many workmen with modern technology, but definitely it's going to take time. If you see the temple being built, or signs of it, then you know it is really close. Really, really close. And uh, so we need real things. You know, we, we don't just read any book and say, oh, you know, uh, the guy who wrote long ago, uh, 1988, which was a good year, because Israel was formed in 1948, so he come 40 years, one generation. So in 1988, uh, this guy wrote a book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 1988. Of course, 1988 came and went. So, to make more money, the next day he put 89 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 1989. <laughs> this guy is just, you know, wrong prophecy, wrong interpretation. A lot of people have missed in the interpretation. So we're not interested in all those speculation. We want more concrete things to deal with. 
And we will surely know that this, all these things about Antichrist and everything that he, he is to do, you need the temple. It cannot happen without a temple. The temple must be rebuilt. <coughs> so when you see the signs of the movement of the temple, one day it will. <coughs> People thought it was impossible for the Jews to become a nation. Because since General Titus of the Roman Empire destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70, no, and disperse all the Jews for nearly 2,000 years, they did not have a country to call their own. Until the end of the Second World War, that when after 6 million of them had died under the Nazis, that the Jews had a chance to have a place to call their country. Nearly 2,000 years, symbolic in Hosea as two days. And so we see a lot of prophecy pointing out to those things. Today, it's an established fact Israel is a nation. But that's only one part of the prophecy. There's another prophecy that will take place in our time before the end of the end. The third temple has to be rebuilt for all these things to occur. Where, when, how, doesn't matter. But that will be the sign you look for, assumption one of the end time, to know how near we are at the end. I don't think that the temple will exist for a long, long time and then the Antichrist come. I believe it's all going to be very fast. So the third temple will be the main thing we look for. Assumption number two. Many people think that when the Antichrist comes, that he will be the one world empire and rule the world. No, he won't. Revelations just say that he will control trade, buying and selling by his mark. It did not say he will rule the world. Because even in the book of Daniel, when again it repeats prophecy about the end times, it says that some countries will escape his hand. In Daniel chapter 11, Verse 41. Oh, the most of the part of prophecy in Daniel 11 applies to Antiochus Epiphanes IV. There are some parts of it that completely does not apply to him. In verse 41, it says, He, referring to the Antichrist, shall also enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape from his hand. Look, these shall escape from his hand. Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. You know those three, three areas? They represent the wilderness area where the woman in Revelation 12 fled to. They will flee into the wilderness and somehow the hand of God will protect them in a miraculous way. So the Antichrist doesn't rule all, all the whole world. He will definitely influence the world. He will definitely have some measure of control over the whole world. <coughs> but his rulership is over the region of the Roman Empire revised. RRV, revised Roman Empire. Of which he was one of the ten horns who conquered and enlarged his territory uh, into uh, knock down three other horns if you read the book of Daniel. So he remains within the domain of the revised Roman Empire. No, the Antichrist will not set up his headquarters in Singapore <laughs> or Malaysia. He will always seek to rule from the Middle Eastern region. It's very strange that our world today still is affected by anything happening in the Middle East. But let me read more scriptures here in chapter 11, verse 44. But news, uh, verse 43, 44, He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver, over all the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. 
but news from the east and north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. Do you notice that news from the north and from the east? So the Antichrist will rule over generally the area of the revised Roman Empire and uh, uh, his border of his empire will not extend into Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand. It will not extend to the Pacific Islands in Tonga or, or Philippines or Japan. Uh, all those are, no, all those are just under his influence because if you control the mark, you control the means uh, let's say, if you control the banking system, that's it, you got the whole world. So as long as you could exist without money, you're outside his domain. So he will influence, but he won't have that kind of uh, imaginative antichrist, one world ruler that people attribute to him. He is just one of the dominant uh, future nations that arise out of the Middle Eastern area when it's expanded to uh, be part of the Revised Roman Empire. Uh, what we're interested in is here is when the East is mentioned because there is assumption number two that Asia will be in some sort of, and that's why we're interested in those kind of assumptions, that Asia will be in some sort of relationship with the Antichrist, but not exactly under the Antichrist because he talk about news from the East, news of war. And the East covers the whole Asia-Pacific region that is normally outside the domain of the Antichrist. Let's look at some things in the book of um, uh, Revelations. In Revelations, And uh, <clears throat> what we're interested to look at is uh, Revelations. And a uh, section that we want to consider <clears throat> in uh, Revelation chapter 16, verse 12. Although some of these things will take place dramatically as the book of Revelation says, remember the book of Revelation, if you read my book on uh, Foundational Series 14, most of Revelation is under the seven-year period, <coughs> which is why we don't see some of these things, you know, like one-third of the of vegetation burn, one-third of the sea turn into the blood. We don't see those things, except during the seven years. And uh, most of it is under the seven-year period. In chapter 16 of Revelations, we see in verse 12, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings, plural. Now, kings tell me that several nations still exist in the time of the Antichrist, not just one king, kings, from the east might be prepared. And uh, when you tie this news of the east with the book of uh, Daniel chapter 11, uh, uh, about the east where the Antichrist does not rule, assumption number two is that the Antichrist does not control the eastern sector of this earth, the Asian Pacific region. He has influence through trade and controlling the world system. He can control to a certain measure, but he does not physically or powerfully set up his headquarters here in that sense. And although all buying and trading is controlled by him, there are still kings of the East that exist, which means that there it will be a great power. 
it will be a great power. What we're seeing in our time is a time in our world like never before. We do not, those of us who grew up or who were born in the 20th century, which most of us are, most of us who were born in the 20th century, we have not known a world where America was not number one or England was not number one. We have always lived in a world where the good guys were ruling the world. I mean, at least reasonably good guys. Uh, they are, they are they meant to do good. We have not lived in a world where the bad guy was winning. In the Second World War, of course, the bad guy seemed to win for some time, but it doesn't last long. But we are going to live in a different world where we can assume that what we see of China or Japan, of the Asia-Pacific rising to be a world power, will continue. It will continue right up to the time of the Antichrist. You know why? Because they were still around when the Antichrist was around. Which means they didn't falter or fail. They were still powerful kings who rule and reign. Of course, remember, when the Bible says kings, it could be whatever kind of world system that they were using. So symbolic language. But we can see assumption number two, that the Asian Pacific region, especially China, Japan, all these regions, we of course want to include Australia and New Zealand along, and all these will continue to function to a certain extent and become strong in the area of uh, nation building, economy, or world influence. It's going to be a different world where we're not influenced from the other side of the Western country all the way from America, but in the area of the kings of the East. It so happened we're all located at the moment in the Eastern sector. And that's why this kind of assumption is important to us because uh, some of us may be saying, wow, you know, let's hash all our bet now on Europe. There are some happenings in the East too that we need to be aware. We need to balance prophecy. Because some, some people say, wow, Euro, Euro is a thing to do. Dump all your money into Euro. <laughs> but there are some things that are outside the domain of the Bible that are still happening in the East. So remember that. There is a second assumption that is hidden in the background, that the kings of the East are mighty nations. And they might have done some sort of deal with the Antichrist. But they were strong enough to do some sort of a deal. But at some point, possibly, they would begin to disagree or begin to try to battle with him or whatever things will happen. But underneath this second assumption, it's a historical event that you can look forward to. The Euphrates will dry up. And you know the region of the Euphrates in the Middle East? Today is drying up. Even the Dead Sea is drying up. And when you see all totally dry, then you know like the building of the second temple, you know there is a second sign that is being fulfilled in the Bible. Now, it does say in chapter 16 that, there, that it all happens in the seventh year with all those bowls falling all over the place. But we can see the nearness of the times. And recently, I, there are certain things I keep tap off when the Bible mentions them. One of them is this Euphrates thing, and once in a while I look back to, uh, in, in our modern world history to see what's happening in the Euphrates. And the news that has been coming forth has been, the water is getting less and less. It's actually drying up. It's getting less and less. Now it's just mushy. Before it was a great river. And part of it, of course, is human development, all this where they're damming up uh, all those waters. The Bible predicts it will completely dry up. 
There are a lot of Bible predictions too. Look at the book of uh, Isaiah chapter 19, which we have mentioned in our book to a certain extent. In Isaiah chapter 19, It says in Isaiah chapter 19, verse 23, In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrian will come into Egypt, and the Egyptian into Assyria, and the Egyptians will serve with the Assyrians. And the region of Assyria is in the area today that we know of as uh, Iraq and uh, Syria. There is a prediction in the Bible that that whole region together with Israel will be at least a region where those nations have some sort of a treaty. When President Sadat in the 1970s signed a treaty with Israel, it was part of the fulfillment. We have not seen the other part. And you look at it today, they look like they're going to fight. You know, it doesn't look like they're friendly. But so was Egypt and Israel. They used to fight wars before. But we will see this fulfilled too. Everything pointing to events that happen in the end time. All this preparing for the way to the Euphrates of the kings of the East. So the second assumption, a false assumption, of course, is that the Antichrist will be over the whole world, including every single Pacific country. The Antichrist somehow has his hand in it. That's a false assumption. The, the real second assumption is that the kings of the East will be a power of their own. They vie with the Antichrist, although he has control of the world system and money system. Third assumption, also taken from uh, the book of Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. Now, on those assumptions, we summarize again. The first assumption is that there will be a third temple built. So we look for the signs of that, uh, for the Antichrist to do all his stuff. Second assumption is that the Eastern Bloc, or whatever it means, the Eastern Bloc, Southeast Asian, Asian nations, will continue to rise and rise as an economic and political power to a certain extent, which we are seeing in our time which now is an accepted fact in, by economists today. But it's important for us to take note of that. That it is not... Uh, now we have people are saying, oh, you're saying the same thing economists are saying, but more. It is not a temporary thing. It's a permanent rise that will continue even with the rise of the European nation and the revised Roman Empire. The Bible seems to assume that they are in a power that is continuous. And that we can be sure of. Chapter 11, it speaks of, in verse 44, news from the east and the north shall trouble him. The word him is the Antichrist. So we know the east must be powerful enough to trouble him and the north. Who are the north? They themselves, in Daniel chapter 11, the Antichrist is himself referred to as the king of the north because they are uh, roughly north of Israel. So in north of the north, what else is north? Gog and Magog, which in the book of Ezekiel, let's look at the book of Ezekiel. And... Uh, <clears throat> Book of Ezekiel, chapter 38 and 39. Ezekiel, chapter 38 and 39. Somehow, the east and the north will do some sort of a battle with the Antichrist, who will in the end, of course, be victorious. 
before the Antichrist does battle with Almighty God. So here we have Gog and Magog. In, uh, these are the old Bible words for those nations. It was one and two. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Uh, thankfully, in our times, a lot of scholars have done research on the region of Gog, Magog, Rosh, and uh, Meshach, and Tubal. Those whole regions cover the area of the Soviet Union, including Russia, which is Rosh, and a lot of those areas under Russia. And uh, uh, in those regions, uh, formerly part of Russia, all those regions generally together are in the domain of Gog and Magog. And you look at what they have done here, uh, there will come a time when their influence moved all the way down to Persia in verse 5, Ethiopia and Libya. And that is why you continually see even in our time that no matter how powerful the United States is, Russia continues to be influenced in the Middle East. And of course, with the demise of the United States as a world power, and especially when there's an economic collapse of the US dollar, which is coming, it's something that is a, a determined event. It's only when it will happen, not whether it will happen. It's a question of when, not whether. It's a definite event that's taking place. Uh, Russia will continue to rule. And some people say in verse 6, uh, some of the scholars have researched Goma, which is the old name for Germany. And all these troops, the house of uh, Togama from the far north, and all these troops, many are with you. So all this somehow come against Israel for some reason. And so, the book of Ezekiel chapter 38 predicts a war, a war with Gog, Magog, and Russia. And when you try to tie it up to the end time and seeing when it happens, then we realize that all this is also thrown into the seven-year thing when uh, the Antichrist hears news from the north, which is assumption number two. Uh, number three, that Russia will remain a power. If you look at the old map of the Roman Empire, certain parts of Russia seem to be under it, but the major part of Russia is outside. Too cold up there. And world conquerors like Napoleon Bonaparte have failed when they try to go against Russia. And the major turning point in the German Nazi empire was when they tried to conquer Russia and to their demise. In the end, we realize God has a destiny separate for Russia. And even though today we look at it, what good can come out of that? How, how can there be a world power? I do not know. I only know the Bible. And the Bible seems to have reserved a place where it will play an important role in world, our present modern world history. Unfortunately, not much in the Bible seems to be mentioning about the United States directly. So it's very odd. It seems that England and the United States are part of the Christian era. And then we come to the last days as you come closer and closer to the Jewish era and dispensation. Other countries play a role. And the role of uh, China and all the Asia-Pacific nations rising, and uh, the role of Russia and all their satellite nations under their influence rising, is a determined thing in the Bible. For them to have enough power to attack or try to war against the Antichrist tells you how powerful they need to be. Because the Antichrist is going to be very, very, very powerful. 
as we know, politically and uh, financially, every area. So for the king of the north uh, and king of the east to have any impact on them, it seems that the end time politics revolve around the kings of the east, the kings of the far north Gong and Magog, and the Antichrist ruling, especially in the Middle Eastern sector of that region. Three assumptions. There's assumption of the Third Temple, assumption of the rise of the kings of the east that continue to rise. It's not a temporary thing. Even now, we have economists predicting the fall of, uh, of the, the, the rise of the uh, eastern economy. But it seems that the Bible continues. I mean, there will be cycles, but it will continue strong. And even now, a lot of economists don't trust Russia because there's too much of, uh, and you, if you notice, uh, in those areas, too much of uncontrolled there. But yet the Bible has a place where it will play a, a, a figure of world influence. And if you look carefully, these are the countries that also have nuclear power. So Russia will continue to play a major influence uh, on the world in the time of Antichrist. Assumption three is that it will actually be a world power. If you ask me so, I'm not sure how. But when I look at the modern history to determine what in the natural gave it a power, I found one thing. Most of the energy supply to the European area depends on Russia. They just shut off the energy and all of them will be very cold for the winter. So somehow, they will have some sort of influence and power uh, that will continue to rise. Uh, in this assumption number three. So there are three assumptions. Assumption of the third temple, assumption of uh, the rise of the east, assumption of, of uh, Russia and Gog and Magog, those regions that represent them being a world power outside of the revised Roman Empire that will continue to trouble the Antichrist where he has to watch it. Now, how do we respond in this end time prophecy to all these areas that we see predictions uh, in the end time. Well, let's look at some advice that Jesus gives to us from the book of Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, uh, Jesus tells us there in verse 8, uh, let, let me read from verse 4 onwards. Jesus says, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I'm, Christ, I'm the Christ and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumours of wars, see that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, there will be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So apparently, the world will enter a sorrowful period in which all these events take place. Even today, we have as many people more than ever before claiming to be Jesus Christ. You have a few of them walking around in South America. You have a few of them in America. You have some in Russia claiming to be the Christ or the reincarnation of the Christ. All these are false. There is only one Christ, Jesus. And uh, uh, it tells us there, there are always rumours of wars and actual wars. Uh, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famine, pestilence. This time we touched on the last week. But it was said, these are the beginning of sorrows. Not necessarily a bad thing. From prophetic realm, in the world, it looks like a bad thing. Here we cross-reference to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. It tells us here, in terms of the sorrows that are to come, in verse 18 onwards, 
Romans 8 verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility and not willingly, but because of him who subjects it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Labors with birth pangs. So while there's the beginning of sorrows and all the nations in the world line up into place, on the opposite side, there will be taking place something else, the revealing of the sons of God, which include, of course, um, men and women. Sons of God representing the glorious church. While it grows darker out in the world of uncertainty, things within the body of Christ or true believers in the Lord, Nowadays, when you talk about church, there's an organized church that sometimes don't even believe in Jesus. Uh, you're talking about true believers. There will be rising the glorious church. And what will be part of this glorious church we find in the book of Ephesians chapter uh, 4. In Ephesians chapter 4. Where it talks about the fivefold ministries. See, the rise of all the fivefold ministry and why we're building a fivefold church is important to these end times. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, right on to verse 16. And he himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And even what deception is in the world, many claim to be Christ. Those who truly know Christ will not be because in verse 14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men in a cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. The fivefold ministries will establish the church and perfect the church until the church cannot be deceived. Can you imagine? A church that cannot be deceived. That is the end time church that God is raising. The first step, of course, is the restoration of the fivefold ministry in verse 11. If you don't have verse 11 and 12, you don't have verse 13 and 14. Because verse 13 starts with the word till, until we all become equipped. So we need 11 and 12 to equip us. Very important. And so one on that side is the beginning of sorrows. On the church side, the glorification of the church of God. <coughs> where people will grow deeper and deeper into Him. And you notice there's a phrase in Romans 8 that tells us in verse 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory <coughs> which shall be revealed in us. Not outside us. In us. It's a glory that is revealed from within. <coughs> Matthew 24. Matthew 24. <coughs> we see here in uh, verse 16 onwards, when the abomination of desolation has taken place, it starts in verse 15. <coughs> and uh, that's all in the... From verse 15 onwards, it's all in the... in the seven-year period, abomination. <coughs> but in verse uh, 13 and 14, that's right, we want to focus on. <coughs> he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached 
in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Thank you. And uh, so we have here, in verse 13, that there is an endurance that is necessary. Jesus used the word endure. Because some things we overcome, some things we endure through. And it's important for us to realize that Jesus doesn't take us off, out from the lion's den. He takes us through the lion's den. <coughs> Endurance is overcoming through the difficulty. Overcoming is not just being taken plucked out of the problem. Overcoming is to be able to go right through and come out unscathed. Uh, endurance is going through the lion's den without being harmed. Endurance is going through Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace without the smell of smoke on you. That is a picture of the endurance that God wants to bring forth unto us. And the word endurance and overcoming points to uh, the times that we live in that God has. And a picture of that is in uh, Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace. The key wasn't just what the people did, but it was the presence of God. Let's look at the book of Daniel here. In Nebuchadnezzar's uh, fiery furnace, which is a picture uh, that points also to endurance in the end time. It's a great picture that we want to take note of. <clears throat> Chapter 3, when the three friends of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow to the false gods, they were prepared to sacrifice their lives. But in verse 19, Nebuchadnezzar, chapter 3, verse 19, Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury and the expression on his face changed to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. Look at the word seven times. Again, talking about the increase of tribulation. He commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. These men who were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments <coughs> were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because of the king's command was urgent and the furnace was exceedingly hot, <coughs> the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's how fear. They opened the door, they died. These three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counsellors, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said, The king, true, O king. He says, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. And when they called them out in verse 27, the, they saw the men whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. That's a picture of the glorious church going through endure. So when you talk about endurance, it's not like half dead, half dead, you know, you're going to die, and you're just enduring until Jesus saves you. This endurance is a powerful endurance that has a power and the presence of God within us that renews us, transforms us, and changes us on the inside is an overcoming endurance, not just a uh, you know, suffering endurance, a waiting for it to come to an end. And then Nebuchadnezzar's furnace represents the presence of God that he's going to release. Because it, the promise is to us here in 1 uh, Peter chapter 4, 
First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. Again, talk about the fiery trial in verse 12. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fire trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering that when His glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And when you put all these verses together, what will happen is that in the end times, while there is the beginning of the sorrows and there is all this turmoil, in God there's a glorious church rising and there will be an increase of the presence of God's glory on His people. The more they persecute, the more they despise, the more the spirit of glory will rise. Like the presence of the Son of God, the fourth man in the fiery furnace, the presence of God will be seen and the glory of God will be seen in His last day church. And that is reserved. Uh, in, in fact, all those things are to bring out this glory. It's to bring out this glory. It's for the sake of purification that this glory is brought forth and the spirit of glory. If you study the word glory, when you talk about all the earth is filled with His glory and the glory of the Lord shall cover the earth. That cover the area where Jesus is in Matthew 24 that He who endured to the end will be saved and this gospel will be preached to all the nations of the world. It is, a, is a, the gospel of the glory of God. And we close with 2 Corinthians chapter 5 to show forth that the gospel that we have understood today to be that of the love of God, the grace of God, it's speaking about <coughs> the glory of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It says in verse 9, For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. And so he speaks of this glory in verse 18. We all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image. And you look at some of the things I went through in verse 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ and the life of Jesus, that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our body the fourth man seen within our temple, that they would bring forth and show forth the glory of the Lord. And he says in verse 15, for all things are for your sake, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. And it's all for the purpose of this glory of God 
the end time glory. The end time glory is more powerful than any glory that has been revealed in any other age. You remember the Old Testament, all the glory in the presence of God? Far exceeding. We have only seen glimpses of it in Christian revival. But we will see an outpouring of His glory in the end times. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we pray that you give us an understanding, O Lord, of the end times and of all that you have. And you help us to understand, Father, the times that we live in. Especially, Lord, as we see the three end time assumptions. And these are going to happen, O God, in these last days to see the third temple. And we know the end is near. We are already seeing the rise of the Eastern Bloc for it is recognized even today in 2009 that it's nations like China that is pulling the world out of recession. But yet it's, a, it's still shaky, Lord, and only permitted because of your predictions in the Bible. But you will cause the rise, O oh God, the Eastern Bloc, and Father, we do not know what's all that's happening in Russia and all those regions. But we know, Father, that you have the destiny to, Lord, where Russia will always continue to cast a shadow over all of Europe. We thank you, Father, that even when we see the signs of the end times rising, that we will not despair and do not despair because we see firstly the glorious church and we see the possibility of the spirit of glory in us and we see this glory extend till it cover over all the earth. Thank you, Father, for your grace and mercy that you establish in these end times and give us wisdom, give us wisdom, give us understanding Remove all confusion, especially as we see many predictions here and there, that we have a clarity in the times that we live in. We thank you, Father. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Let's all rise together as we sing a closing song. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And indeed, His blessings continue to flow. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly. God, that your face continue to shine upon each one of us. Cause your face, Lord, to shine upon us and you go before us, O Lord. And you prosper all the way of your people. May your face to shine upon us to keep us, Lord. And you cause us, Lord, to increase on the left hand and on the right hand. The blessings of your grace and your power, Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen. Praise God. 
uh, service officially over. Those who need ministry will pray for you. Uh, and there's a sister wearing a whitish color blouse. You're having uh, recent abdominal pains that God wants to touch and heal. And uh, uh, different ones with different ailments will pray for you and anoint you as the Lord gives us uh, an anointing and His grace to minister. Praise God. God bless each one of you as you go. Pray.